Welcome to the Market Moment. My name is Matt Walters, and I am with uh, John Martfelt, almost forgot your name, and Lee Mackey. And today we've got some great topics we want to talk about. Before, we, But before we get into that, remember to join the growing Market Moment online community by hitting the subscribe but button. Give us a comment, like, subscribe. It really goes a long ways, and uh, we appreciate it. So first, we want to talk about the behavior gap. So what do we mean by the behavior gap? So in, uh, investing is highly emotional, incredibly difficult, right? Anyone who says investing is easy is has probably not been a long-term investor and gone through right. different market cycles and economic cycles. And investing can be and is very, very difficult. And the behavior gap is this, is the reality of how most people underperform their own investments, right? They basically, they get in their own way. Um, so it's, it's very common for someone to, you know, let their emotions and their feelings come in and dictate their decisions at the worst possible times, right? We've seen it. We've probably, I know I've done it personally. Um, we've seen it with people that we work with and it can be extremely difficult. Um, so, you know, there's a Morningstar report out there. There's a lot of research that, 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 that's out there that gets into kind of the details behind this and what it means, but, Morningstar report basically said that, you know, when you're looking at fund performance, so just looking, I think they were looking at just kind of some of the largest mutual funds out there and the funds performance, the average investor in those funds trail the funds performance by 1.7% because of the um, behavior gap, the emotional side of getting in or out at the wrong time and not sticking with the original plan. So thoughts on this or examples that you guys... <clears throat> I have lots of examples in my career. I know Lee does as well. You know, I go back, <clears throat> I've got one current one. I've got my son who's just now getting into investing. You know, he's 22 years old and he watches NVIDIA <clears throat> and he calls me all the time because I have a little account for him. Yeah. And it's, uh, dad, buy NVIDIA. It's up 50 cents. And then a minute later, dad, sell it. It's down $2. <laughs> I mean, that's an emotional roller coaster. It's in an incorrect way to invest, right? right. But that's a, on a very small scale side. But going back to like 2008, 2009, this is the common theme in 2009, March of 2009, when the market would hit the all, you know, hit 6,400 on the Dow, and, and now it's at 40,000. A lot of people using the emotional side, they couldn't handle what they went through in 08 and 09, early 09. They got out of the market completely, and then they stayed out for years and years and years, and then they got back in, and they missed a 200% run up on the market because. Instead of following the course without, you know, letting emotion out of it. Think about this. The, the Dow, using the Dow, 6,400, and it went to 40,000. What does the Dow have that we don't have? It does not have emotion. It's sure. just the Dow, right? Yeah. It's just the stocks. If you just followed that without your emotion, you go from 6,400 to 40,000. But to your point, most investors don't do that. On the flip side, when the market's riding high, I've done some uh, retirement analyzer stuff here at yeah. Mach 1. and. Clients are doing really, really well, and they're they're exceeding well because the market has has done really well since two thousand nine. Okay, and so people are up and they're doing great. And you do their you talk about risk and you talk about all the things. And, and another common thing that we hear that I hear is that well, I don't want to get out of things right now. The market's just going going nuts. I don't want to I don't want to get out. Right. And so then they if the market crashes and they stay in and they don't need to be in. I mean, there's two sides to that. Oh, coin, sure. Right. And emotion sure. does drive. 90% of investors. And that's our job to help them take emotion out. And I can give many, many countless examples of where people have missed out because they let their emotion control their investing. Yep. You know, there's a reason why when we go to conferences, um, the psychology of investing, those kind of classes are becoming bigger yeah, and bigger. Very popular. Um, you know, it's, it's a real thing. Um, you know, we, we're a headline driven society. Um, you know, we're no different than our clients in that respect, uh, to a large extent. Um, you know, clients or no human behavior, you know, we have this thing called a phone now that we get, we get information instantly. instantly yeah. Everything is breaking news. And so <clears throat> people are human and they react to the latest thing that they hear or see, you know, you're, you're at the water cooler at the yeah. office and so-and-so tells you to 
that they did this or did that. And so, you know, one of the reasons why Warren Buffett has done so well is because he he basically goes contrary. He ignores all of it. He, he goes the opposite I mean, of the masses. You know, he, he'll, yep. he'll, he has been flat out you know, brutally honest and said that, you know, when he sees blood in the streets, yeah. he's buying. He goes and gets it. Yeah. You know, and then when he sees it, everybody is you know, racing into the market, he's pulling back. Yep. I mean, and so, you know, this, what did you call it? The behavior gap. The behavior gap. Um, and this emotion in investing, I mean, it's it's at an all-time high, it seems it's like. It's an all-time high. I, I think a lot of it comes Agreed. from overconfidence. Um, and not in that they're overconf- overconfident in that we think we know more than we know. Sure. Right. Right. Or we see something and we think we have like some inside information, inside right. baseball to what's going on. And right. I assure you, none of us do. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. The market's efficient. The market. No doubt. If there's information out there, the market's priced it in. No doubt. Um, immediately. I mean, it, literally with the way you were just talking about how quick information gets out there. If there is information to be known in that a profit can be had because of it. Yeah. It's, it's already happened. And so this idea that you can like read an article that was written by a journalist that probably has very little financial sophistication at all, but that's their job to go find something and write an article. And you can read that and then decipher that and make an investment decision based off of it. You're probably one, six months too late. Yep. And it's probably the wrong decision to begin. No doubt. I went to a meeting. This has been several years ago, but you know, at the beginning of the year, throughout the year, um, Fortune magazine, Forbes magazine would have the ten best Stock growth stone. mutual funds, or, yeah, or yeah. the 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 fifteen best value funds to own. When that went to when that article was being written, was like nine months earlier. By the time yeah. that it w- went to print, it was old news. No doubt. And, and to your point, you know, it's just if you're reading it. It's, it's been, good. It may be good information to just know, but it's not information that you can act on. Yeah. No, you know how many times I've been told, you know, I have a client come in and they show me an ETF ticker or a mutual fund ticker that was from a magazine or something. They say, hey, this is the thing to own. And, you know, they, they really want it. And then the thing just does terrible, right? Yeah. But I, I'll tell you something. You were talking about this before off air when we were doing our pre or makeup. We were doing makeup. Uh, you were talking about Tesla, right? And you think about a couple of, like a month ago, Tesla had the recall. Have you guys seen the Tesla truck driving around town, yeah. right? They're starting yeah. to become There's more of yeah. And I, I honestly have a couple times gone and tried to put trash. and lift. It looks like a dumpster to me. But yeah. anyway, um, the truck itself had some recalls, right? So it's had some massive issues, and Tesla's had some bad news. And about a month ago, it was like $170 a share. And it would it, emotionally, right? Why would you buy something that has recalls, that has this? And look at the price now. Yeah. We were talking about that's shot up. So the point of it is not... We can't d- tell when something's going to do what it's going to do. We're not, you know, we're not going to be able to, to predict that. You'd never think Tesla would be where it's at now a month ago today, right? And emotionally, you'd be like, I don't want to have anything to do with Tesla because of all this bad news, kind of like Boeing. Mm-hmm. But it might be the time to buy it. That's when Warren Buffett's go in and buy stuff like that. Well, you know, we, we, <clears throat> do, we do the re- retirement analyzer. And, you know, we yeah. have clients that are moderate investors, moderate aggressive and and I will get this question, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do the, the score, the risk score, and they're moderate. And then they'll ask, well, if the markets, you know, we come back in six months, and if the markets are booming, I may want to change that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. And then my question is, why? <laughs> what has changed yeah. in your makeup that now all of a sudden, just because the markets are higher, makes you want to be, you know, an aggressive investor? You know, it's the fear so, of missing out. But, sure. Yeah, yeah, there's a ton of FOMO. Yeah, yeah. and then, exactly. but I'll, I'll say, well, <clears throat> what happens if the markets are down 20%? Yeah. Does that mean that you all of a sudden become a conservative investor? Right. And so, and it, it's almost the opposite. You know, not they should be who they yes. are always. Yeah. But in that example, I'd be, I would personally, you know, recommend being the opposite, right? If it's down 20, well, get more aggressive. And, <laughs> well, the, the, and yeah. the longer we're in this business, <clears throat> the more psychologists and therapists and counselors we become to, to try to smooth out that no doubt. emotional. No doubt. The last thing you need to listen no to doubt. when it comes to investing is your gut. Oh yeah. Because you're, you'll wake up one day and you'll just be like, it'll just, for whatever reason, you'll just have a day and you'll just be like fearful. You'll have anxiety. Yeah. Right. And you'll be like, 
I just don't have a good feeling. Right. Right. And three days later, you'll wake up, you know, and be like, you know what? The future's bright. <laughs> like we're, let's go. And no doubt. you can't, you can't <clears throat> get, and it's, it's, it's human nature. We all struggle with that and have to hold each other accountable and be yeah. there and kind of yeah. coach each other through <clears throat> that. Um, but it can be incredibly, incredibly difficult. So don't, you know, definitely don't listen to your gut. And another thing is like, have the long term plan. Like, what's the objective? Exactly. And yeah, I talk about exactly. this all the time. But what's exactly. the objective? I feel like, you know, people feel like they've missed out on opportunity if they've missed a, a segment of the market that's run up. Right. And it's like, <clears> well, we could have this. And it's like, well, but what would the what? Then what's the strategy? Are you going to cash out and sit on the sidelines, or right. you know, like <clears throat> you hear these commercials and these articles that like, well, what's your number? What do you need at retirement? Well, that's, you know, that's great. Yeah. I'm all about setting goals and like working towards something. But the number you have the day you retire, unless you're going to just cash everything out. And exactly. Get, it doesn't really matter. It What matters is like, how do you perform from then on? Yeah. Right. And like, how, what kind of volatility do you have and what kind of income do you need to take out? It's 100%. not like, <clears throat> what is that total number? And it's like, okay, we hit it. We're good. Well, if your portfolio gets cut in half over the next 12 yep. months, like that number probably never mattered. Well, you're right. What we're talking about now kind of goes back to kind of what we talked about last week or the week before where, you know, the market has been so bifurcated, you know, with That's growth. a big word. By Thank way. you. I mean, don't ask me to spell it. <laughs> you can you can Google or, it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Bifurcated. Anyway, <laughs> you know, clients <clears throat> will come in and go, man, I want to go to buy NVIDIA or yeah. I want to buy these yeah. growth stocks or – you know, when the other parts of their portfolio are doing just fine. No doubt, yeah. But the, you mentioned earlier this FOMO, fear of missing out. And it's real, especially when you're talking to your buddies, yeah. you know, at lunch and on the golf course. And, and it can last. This is this is the hard part. It can last for a long time. Oh, sure. It's yeah. not like, yeah. hey, a quarter or two where, you know, you might. I mean, it can be years yeah. of watching something else do extraordinarily well. Yeah. And you're like, I'm not doing that well. And so then yeah. that's when you get into the chasing game. And you chase it late. And you're, and, sure. and, you're, and, and the other thing, 2000, you know, when the tech crash happened and 2008, the financial crisis happened, we haven't had really a big pullback since those two, those are the two last big pullbacks. Um, how many people have just completely stopped investing? How many people that we know that will never invest again? And it's all, it's just fixed income for the first time in 15 years, fixed income is decent, right? you know, for a little bit of time here, but, but that's people miss out and not only on going in, in too late, but they get emotional on when, when they get their butt kicked, you know, the nice thing about what we do here at Mach one, which I love, and I can't say this enough, our retirement analyzer, which is what we all do for every client that comes in the door. It helps the client see what they're what they need to make what they on their money, need. right? Yeah. And what they need to earn on their money. And a lot of times, I'll do that, and I'll come back and say, "You only need to make five percent of your money to make it to age one hundred, at, at what you want to do in your life." And when you show them that, then it's a lot easier to talk about how you invest and allocate, and sure. you can miss the forty percent run up because you don't need to be in that type of market, right? Because again, like to your original point. We have no idea when that's going to come down. We could be experts, listen to news all day long. We could be ahead of the game on most people and have that as our passion, but we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. On this panel, I've been the one that's saying that we're going to have this you know, end of the run at some point. I've been wrong for a year. So eventually I'll be right. Dead clock is right twice a day, right? So eventually I'll be right. But right. the point is that I've not been taking people out of the market, sure. even though I felt like we would have something, right? Because it's about – their plan matching what they are supposed to do. And if you do that and you have us to help you, you don't have to worry about your emotion getting involved. True. We'll help take it out of the out yeah. of the equation. Yeah. It's a real thing. We'll talk about that a lot um, moving forward. Um. We'll, we'll end this segment with a quote from Warren Buffett. I, I love his quotes. The key to successful investing is to have the temperament of a poker player when you are not the house. Basically like just yeah, no emotion. Yeah, no emotion. I like it. All right. So second topic, should the Fed cut rates this year? So um, <laughs> some some interesting stuff here real quick. Uh, this is going back. We talked about this for a long time. We haven't talked about it in a while, but the yield curve inverted July 5th of 2022. Longest in history before a session was his previously 624 days. And we are currently at 735 yeah. since the mm -hmm. yield curve inverted. Very, um, you know, not normal situations this time with the way and why the Fed 
or yeah. the, the <clears throat> yield curve inverted with what the Fed did, you know, with interest rates. But uh, we're sitting here, you know, July 9th, 2024, <laughs> we're a few couple years into this, you know, higher interest rate um, period. And the market's held in there, done really well. The economy's held up. Unemployment's ticked up a little bit, but still very strong. Um, you know, employment is very strong. What do you think? Not what do you think? I'm not asking what you think they will do. Yeah. I'm asking you what you think they should do between now and the end of the year. You want me to go first, Lee? <laughs> I feel like I need like so a, I know, I know like we a, have different opinions. Okay. Ding, 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 ding. ding, ding. Yeah. So, I, I think there's two things that are going to – okay, just to kind of go in a circle here. Uh, I think there's two things that could make the Fed lower rates, and it's going to be if they get their inflation target down the way they want. And it could not, not necessarily be to the 2% they originally said. But close enough. But close enough. Or it's trending, you know, and it has been trending. That's fine. Yeah. Or we go into recession. Like, I think one of those two things is going to – it's going to be when the Fed lowers rates. So if we think we're going to go into recession, like I hope we don't. Of course, we hope we don't. Uh, but it is coming. Winter is coming, as they say in yeah. that show. Winter There's always a coming. future recession. There's a future recession at some point. Right. That, whether that's first or not, I have no idea. But I do think that the and I've said this all along. They made a very strong mandate long ago that they were going to raise rates until they got inflation back down to what they were, what target was at that point was 2%. That might have been an unrealistic target, but the point is that's what they said. Right. They also told us that year that they said that, that they were going to raise maybe three times in that year, and they ended up raising it a whole lot more than that in record numbers, you know. Uh, and then they came in this year, and they predicted every, all the, you know, when they had their little the market plot dots and stuff in the market, they, they showed that we were going to have rate cuts possibly starting in March and then in July and so on. And, of course, those have not happened, so they've been pushed out. And I think that's correct, um, and I think it's fine to leave rates where they are for a while. That's my opinion. Um, until we get one of the, you know, until the inflation goes down to where they want, and I think they should stick to that, and it might take a little while. Just just my opinion. I have no. So you know, you're leaning again, more on the no, no no rate change for should for the rest of the year, but that could change with data tomorrow. Yeah, right? no hedging. You said no. Okay, okay. Lee. <laughs> yeah. Um. I don't think they should. Um. But I think they're going to lower rates long before inflation rate gets to two percent because of the lag. Um, yeah. I think if you wait till inflation rates at two percent, way too long. Yeah. Because, I mean, it, it looks good, it feels good, but a, a lowering of rates takes six to nine months to work its way through. So, I think, I don't think September's gonna happen. I, I unless we we between now and then we get some continuing to get some deterioration in the economy. Um, I don't think it'll. I don't think it has to be a recession before they do. Right. Um, right. I think December's on the table. I think December, you know, I've, I've said on this podcast that I, if it wasn't an election year, I don't think they would at all. Um, right. I think <clears throat> the way that they go about it is well, they'll punt it to December. That way they can say, hey, the hey, election's we over. Were, we weren't helping right. or hurting. We weren't helping or hurting, hurting. exactly, which um, is, I think, wise in my opinion. Of, you know, of, and yeah. I'll tell you, you know, these, these high interest rates, I mean, they they are beginning now to weigh on all parts of I the think economy. So too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're just you're seeing it across the board, yeah. um, from groceries to fast food to oh, yeah. to, to travel to I mean everything, everything. is expensive. Um, I just think that they underestimated. I think everyone underestimated. But is that a rates? Strength. Is that a rates issue? I mean, what happens? What happens if they cut rates? Like, does that Well, help? they're supposed to see that they're supposed to cut rates. And this is the other thing I'll, I'll say, and I'm kind of the pessimist here. I don't think the Fed has done the greatest of jobs. I am not smart enough to be on the Fed or anything like that. But when I look back in history and look at what our, you know, what our Fed is supposed to do, I think they have too much power without any, anybody overseeing them. And I, I go back to March of 2009 or, or 2000, I don't know if it was March, when they changed the rules <clears> on <throat> the yeah. bank reserve requirement. It, and that has changed everything. We don't talk about that that much, but that's kind of like the does Fed just is in wild cowboy land. They do whatever they want. Does and your I, impression of the Fed change if he if they navigate a soft landing? Oh like, no, I think so. Yeah, if they can figure that out, I'm I'm all in. That's great, and I and, hope that's what happens. And I would tell you, we're not far from that. I mean, I don't think anybody would have thought 
a year ago that he would have the Fed would have done what they did, left them as high as they have for this long, and we would still not be having trouble. Having trouble. Yeah. I do think now again my pessimistic view I do think because of all this stuff, you know, you go back to COVID, all that money put into the market, the M2 yeah. money going up and all that stuff, that unproductive money has now kind of wound itself out. Sure. And now you have interest rates, credit card debt. The U.S. citizen doesn't have an unlimited credit card debt like the U.S. government does. So you have all-time high on the U.S. government debt, which isn't as, you know, bad as we might make it seem because our income is fine, whatever. But it's the, in, the, the private sector that I worry about, you know, high credit – card limit debt, the highest we've ever had in our history, with interest rates back up in the 20 to 30% range on that debt, there's going to be a price to pay at some point, right? I mean, money is going to stop going into the economy, and it's stopped from the government, and it's going to stop from the consumer because they're going to be out of money, right? If they've maxed out their cards, and you know, and I do think that that's where I get into the concern that a recession could be around the corner that could cause the rate. Now, I'm hoping I'm wrong, and I'm I hope you're right. I hope there is a soft landing. And I do think the Fed is in a weird, you know, to give them some leeway. I don't, this is unprecedented times, right? We don't know I, I how would to be, unwind all this. I would be surprised now, <clears throat> given where we are in the cycle, that it's anything. I don't think we have a hard landing. I, hope, I think, I hope I think we've right. gotten far enough. For, now, I think we could still have a recession. Yeah. And we could yeah, feel it. It may not be as bad as, yeah. But I, yeah. I think we've worked our way to a point where now we're kind of like, okay. I mean, it's. The, pr the question with the Fed cutting rates is like, how much do they have to cut for it to actually matter? Right. Because they could come out in September, or December, and cut, cut by a quarter, quarter point. point. Yeah. I don't think it does anything. No. No. You know? It just it's it's mentality. It's sentiment. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. sentiment. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's sentiment. Yeah. It's I think it's a positive from an investor, you know, from an investment perspective because it's like okay, they they will cut rates. Yeah. It's yeah. that that They're confirmation. Able to cut rates. It's that confirmation. <laughs> but. Yeah. But if, if they don't cut beyond that, then it's kind of like, okay, we're right back to where we were before. Yeah. I think I any, with that. I think, and I've told people this, I think that this summer, had they began a cutting campaign, the, the average person would have been like, yay, that's awesome. But I think if you look under the hood. Yeah, it may not, have, it probably wouldn't have been the right decision. It, it would have yeah. been that, you know, I've, I've told folks that. It was either something external has happened that was bad, yeah. you know, a war, yeah, yeah, or our economy is in a lot worse shape than we think it is. No doubt. Yeah. Now, this morning I, w I was listening to an interview, um, and I think this kind of plays into what we're talking about. He feels like mortgage rates are going to kind of settle in the six, six and a half percent. And Which is historically and, and that's going to be fine, yeah. kind of the new normal. Yeah. So you think— Which okay, was the old normal. It yeah. was. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. but what does that do— to all these people that would typically look to buy or sell well, and buy, do you want to get rid of your no, no. two and a half, three percent mortgage rate? No, you don't. And I, I'll tell you something else. We've gotten spoiled, right? I mean, sure. we've been spoiled for a long time. The thought that the Fed is going to lower rates enough to matter is a great point because I don't think even if they start a rate cycle down, they're not going to go back down to where we were, no. you know, no. in 2019 or 20. So that, that or 21, that part is going to be hard. And I think the, the, when you look at housing numbers, the inventory is not great because people are holding on to their 3% mortgages, which I would advise them to do, sure. right? And so then they're not selling. So that, that, that part is very real. And then you have new houses that are, the new housing builds are actually doing fairly well. It's the, but the inventory is not great because we don't have that normal cycle to your point. And I think that creates another housing issue, but I think it squeezes out. It's going to be harder and harder for middle class and under to get a house. And that's where it's going to be tough. And the younger people are going to have a harder time getting that American dream for a short amount of time. It will eventually figure itself out. So I think, right? I think to tie these two conversations together, I think the Fed is no different than the average investor. The fewer decisions you make, the probably the better off you are. Yeah. You know, the, the more they would just stay out of it. Um, and, and, you know, I think the better off we would Let be. I wish they would get out of it completely. That's not going to happen. So if they're going to be in it in terms of dictating where rates are, the overnight rate, like they should just make fewer decisions and let the market and the economy adjust. Yeah. And I'm not saying they can just set a flat rate and never adjust it. Sure. But this idea that like 
you know, month to month, quarter to quarter, we're going to tweak and adjust, uh, and it's going to have no. the, like it's like give me a break. Like, They've got way too much. Talk about overconfidence. No uh, doubt, so, they're way too much. We put way too much love and pressure into what they say every single time they talk. It's, yes, here's. I a, mean, the headline right now is you know Jerome Powell. You know, he's testifying to, to this Senate banking panel. Yeah. It's like yeah. all over the screen. Right. We may not want to go down this road, but I do have a quick question. After COVID, obviously the money supply. You know, the, yeah. the money that was injected into the system was astronomical. What mechanism do you think the Fed could have used to bring us back to normal without raising rates? I'm uh, just, I'm, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I, I don't know. So I think we over sent money out. Sure. Right? I do think that that's part of it. So we, we sent too much money out. So that's one thing we as a government could have could have avoided. They had to do what they had to do early on. When the economy started rolling back out, we did not have to keep doing yeah, that. They were, yeah, they Yeah, they did too much. I mean, Kathy and I got checks, and we're like, why do I even – why do I get these checks, right? I mean, it was a year or two or three into this thing, and, like, what are we getting a check for? Yeah. I mean, I, I had a client that tried to send it back. You know I mean? Like, it, it made no sense in a lot of ways how much they sent out, and I think that's where we messed up a little bit. So one thing I think they could have scaled back on how much they sent out, mm -hmm. and I don't know – on the Fed side, like how you do rates, I'll tell you what I think they, I wish they would have done under Barack Obama and Donald Trump. We had strong enough things going on in this country and our economy was moving in the right direction. The rates should have been, should have been higher going into this mess than they were when this mess happened. Oh, a thousand percent. You know, we kept rates helped. way too low, way too low. Yeah. And that could have maybe helped a little bit on the shock and awe of a 500 basis point rate hike year that we had in 22. Mm -hmm. Right, so that maybe it was only been a 200 basis point rate height year if we had other things correct. So I mean, I, I look back and say there's maybe many things, but again, interesting. It's who yeah. knows, you know. Yeah. That's anyway. All right. So we wish the Fed would go away. <laughs> exactly. That was right. Matt Walters. <laughs> <laughs> you can reach I'll him at own, Matt at. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll own that. I'm not afraid to. <clears throat> um, He's young, Lee. He'll, he'll get afraid of something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, that's all we got. Uh, two topics today. So, um, as always, we appreciate you guys listening to the podcast. Give us a like, subscribe, and comment. We'll be sure to uh, mention any of the uh, good comments that we get that come through. You can email the market moment at the market moment at Mach One FGE if you have questions or if you have any ideas or topics that you'd like us to discuss. So, we appreciate you guys listening, and we'll see you next week.